what we're going to be doing starting March 12th and running for 11 weeks thereafter. Monday nights here from 7 to 8 with a panel like we had last year at the Reformation uh, conference, which we hope to exceed in terms of attendance, and that would be our own attendance. I would like to do better than we did last year. And then the attendance around the area. Um, so we're getting business cards made for this event that you can leave at your dining room table uh, if you go out to eat, uh, to give to your neighbors and friends. And the panel is going to be not just pastors, uh, but what they call lay people. Because the Psalms are not really primarily an exercise in the mind, an academic exercise. The Psalms really talk to us in the gut. That's what Scripture calls our emotions, the gut. And that doesn't yield degrees. That just yields experience and life. And so we're going to have school teachers, we're going to have common folk like you and me up here, along with some area pastors. And so the conversation should be, uh, should flow easily. I want to give you a little snippet. Um, the first two we're going to combine into one because we want to really focus on the Psalms. But one is the introduction to difficulties, and the other is solving some of those difficulties before the Psalms really get tackled. And so, just listen here as uh, Dr. Godfrey lays out in the first five minutes here, hopefully whetting our appetites. <clears throat> well, we're beginning a new session uh, on what I'm calling learning to love the Psalms. I don't know what you know about the Psalms, I don't know how you feel about the Psalms, but uh, my sense is that in the church today, uh, many Christians have kind of lost a sense of connection to the Psalms. Uh, there may be a variety of reasons for that. Uh, I think. Um, in earlier generations, when everybody used the King James Version, there was a kind of familiarity with certain phrases and rhythms out of the Psalter that drew people into the Psalms. Uh, there were church traditions that sang the Psalms a great deal. There were church traditions that regularly read Psalms in services. Uh, none of that, I think, is quite as prevalent today as it was in times past. And so my sense is that uh, many Christians today are a little more disconnected uh, from the Psalter than earlier generations were, and uh, certainly I think more disconnected than we really should be. Uh, the Psalms are one of the great treasures that the Lord has given us as His people. Uh, I was at a conference a number of years back, and uh, they were doing a little sort of warm-up game at a small gathering, and uh, they said, now we want you all to write down uh, what is your favorite book of the Bible. And uh, it was not an entirely talented gathering, so I was a little grumpy and, uh, um, you know, thinking all these games are sort of silly. And, and so my, my initial Calvinist uh, reaction was, should we have a favorite book of the Bible? You know, shouldn't we like all the Bible equally? You know, I thought, all right, now, you know, stop that. Be more cooperative. Uh, and, and then I thought, well, you know, I ought to hold the side. I ought to say that Romans is my favorite book, or, or Ephesians. My favorite book. And I thought, all right, no, this is just a game. Let's let's be honest for a minute. What really is my favorite book of the Bible? And as I thought about it, I realized, at least in, in recent years, it's been the Psalms. I've turned to them again and again. I've found tremendous help, tremendous comfort, uh, but also tremendous challenge. I've found them intriguing. And part of what I find intriguing about the Psalms is not only the wonderful things I find there as I read them, but also 
that from time to time I turn to them and I think, what's going on here? Uh, what does this mean? And I also uh, realize that there are uh, wonderful attractions that draw us to the Psalter. Maybe you have a favorite song. Uh, usually in the English-speaking world, people's favorite song is Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. Um, we sometimes think of it just as a funeral psalm, but of course it's not. It's a, it's a wonderful psalm for, for every point in life. But I remember reading a beautiful poem that John Updike, the novelist, wrote about six weeks before he died. He knew he was dying of terminal cancer. And that poem he wrote was in part a meditation on Psalm 23. And the last lines of the poem quoted Psalm 23. And he began the ending of Psalm 23, and he, he began the quotation, surely, and then he paused and wrote, what a wonderful word, surely, surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And then he wrote another, forever. Um, it's, it's touching, you know, and, and what I found moving about the poem was that uh, here's a song we all know, many of us love, and yet, from a poet's perspective, he saw something that I never paused but that, that surely was just a word I kind of rushed by in reading Psalm 22. So, we, we have songs we connect to. I'm from Dutch Reformed churches, and in the Dutch tradition, the favorite psalm is 103. Uh, that begins talking about all the benefits of the Lord to his people. And a reflection on the brevity of life, but on the covenant faithfulness of the Lord. So there are, are these songs that both historically but also today have very much connected with people, um, are, are beautiful, and, and of course represent a unique book in the Bible. Now we know that. So there is a little introduction for you. This series is entitled Learning to Love the Psalms. Now that should give you an idea how the next 11 series are going to unwind. It's not that the mind is of no use, but the Psalms are deeply experiential. And please come. The Psalms are a beloved book, and they will fill you with encouragement and hope and help you process life guaranteed. Guaranteed. Okay, uh, announcements. There will be, as I announced last week, the Galatians study on Wednesday. Uh, it was canceled last Wednesday because our house has been fighting the bug. And so has the Halfland residents. And so the Monday Bible study is canceled for tomorrow due to Carolyn's uh, struggle with uh, the bug as well. But there will be the Galatian study here Wednesday unless something else happens. Any other announcements or anything from anybody? Okay. <clears throat> Carol is not here today. She has fighting some things as well. So uh, let's stand and uh, sing together, Lord, I lift your name on high. Uh, I don't know that I know this. Carol and I trade back and forth each week the song, the um, so, and this is in uh, the, oh, it's in the song book. Okay. Or maybe it's not. No, no, it's not. It's in the red book. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> do we know this one? <laughs> ah, 199. Let me see if I know it here. Uh -huh. 
Yeah, I... Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. Oh, the way from the earth to the cross, my debt to pay. From the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky, Lord, I lift your name on high. You may be seated and join with me as we open up with a word of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you as children in need. Where is mom? Where is dad? That is, that is the cry of a youngster's heart. And indeed, Lord, we are your children. And so this is where you told us to meet you in a very special way. There are gifts here from you to us and gifts that are realized and apprehended in faith. And so, Lord, in that sense, this is your service, even though we have obediently gathered and prepared, it is yours. And we ask, Lord, for your continued steadfast love to be here, to speak to us by name, and to do that which only you can do. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Blessed are those whose ways are blameless. <clears throat> Blessed are those who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies. Blessed are those who seek him with their whole heart. Blessed are those who do no wrong. Oh, that my ways may be steadfast in keeping your statutes. Then I shall not be put to shame. Having my eyes fixed on all your commandments, I will praise you with an upright heart. The same one who bore our judgment has imparted his spirit within us. In this mystical union that we now possess by faith, we are empowered to bear fruit that is pleasing to him. The prayer of our heart, therefore, is, Will what you please, O Lord, and grant what you will. In Christ, we have confessed that we are not what we should be. We are sinners. His law justly weighs in, making our conscience feel its transgressions. But we are not under the law. We are under grace. In the midst of his judgments, Christ has borne the fury of a holy and just wrath on our behalf. Therefore, our guilt is gone. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now in your songbook, turn to number 63 and we'll sing together, O oh God, our help in ages past. Number 63, and Becky, if you can lead us, that would be wonderful. Ages past our hope for years to come, our shelter from the stormy blast and our eternal home. Under the shadow of thy throne still may we dwell secure. Sufficient is thine arm alone and our defense is sure. Before the hills in order stood, our earth received her 
frame. From everlasting thou art God, to endless years the same. A thousand ages in thy sight, Short as the watch that ends the night Before the rising sun Time like an ever-rolling stream Bears all its sons away They fly forgotten as a dream dies at the opening day. O God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come. Be Thou our guide while life shall last and our eternal home. You who fear the Lord, praise Him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify Him, and stand in awe of Him, all you offspring of Israel. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear him. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship you. All the prosperous of the earth eat and worship. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, even the one who could not keep himself alive. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn, that he has done it. Be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. We'll now have the reading of God's Word. <clears throat> the first reading today it's from Genesis 17, 1 through 7, and 15 through 16. But Abram was 99 years old. The Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before him and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you, and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, 
you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall become nations, kings of peoples, and shall kings of peoples shall come from her. Thanks be to God. Uh, our second reading is Romans 4, 13 through 25. For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be the heir of the world, world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. That is why it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations, in the presence of, the, of God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. In hope, he believed against hope, that he should become the father of many nations, as, as he had been told. So shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew in, in his faith as he gave glory to God. Fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. But the words, it was counted to him, were not written for his sake alone, but for yours, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him, who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Hear the word of the Lord. The Gospel reading is from Mark's Gospel, chapter 8, verses 31 through 38. Hear the word of the Lord. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And whoever would save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel's will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. So ends the reading of God's word.
And now we can stand and sing together an inserted hymn in your bulletin. And uh, I'll just... Uh, play this and then we can get started so if you will stand with me and let's sing together number 171 and we'll just listen to the first beginning here Pearson is all atoning blood, and O oh, shall ransom man refuse to suffer her for his God. For the Savior shed his all atoning blood. And, O oh, shall ransomed man refuse to suffer for his God. Ashamed who now can be. To die for him who died, so felt thy martyr, Lord, by thy right hand sustained. He waged for thee the battle strife and threatened death disdained. Upon the golden crown, gazing with eager breath, he fought as one who fain would die, and dying conquered death. Alone he stood unmoved, Amid his cruel foes, O oh, wondrous was the might that then above his tortures rose. Lord, give us grace to bear, like him our cross of shame. To do and suffer what thou wilt for love of thy dear name. Jesus, the King of saints, we praise thee and adore, who are with God the Father one, and spirit evermore. Please be seated. We did it. Thank you. I did forget one thing. Uh, the church has taken on five subscriptions to Table Talk. Table Talk is a daily devotional that is very readable. And so sometimes we wonder, what can I do to grow in grace? What can I do to grow in my knowledge of the Christian faith, of my Lord Jesus Christ? How can I increase my personal relationship with God? Well, it's not unlike Valentine's with your spouse. And indeed, if I understand Scripture, spouse love was formed from that basic relationship of God and his people. And so, if someone asked you if you were in love with your spouse but knew nothing of them, that would seem silly to that person and silly to yourself. You are deeply in love with your spouse the more you know of him or her. Yes, there's some 
rough corners, but not with God. And so these table talks are by the day, and they go through each month, and there's five of them. You may take them home and bring them back, and we will have a year's subscription here. We have February and March. Um, there's an article on Sunday school. So besides the daily devotional, there are some articles that are nice to read. Meaty, sound, good stuff. And they're over there on the table. So uh, please uh, make yourself uh, avail of those. And we have more flyers to be handed out regarding the upcoming class. So I have them here. Take them and go to the grocery stores and go to the uh, places where you go and ask if, they, if you may hang one. And uh, hopefully they will say yes. Okay. Uh, found it. All right. Well, uh, Billy Graham is no longer with us, so I thought it would be an honor to him to have that quote from him. Someday you will read or hear that Billy Graham is dead. Don't you believe a word of it. I shall be more alive than I am now. I will just have changed my address. I will have gone into the presence of God. Praise God for that man who faithfully, most of his years, preaching the simple message, yet the profound message, of Jesus Christ and him crucified. Um, I, the effect on people has been wide-ranging. And uh, um, so... Um, we thank God for his life. There. Wow. Okay. A paradox. Or an antinomy. These are logical words, but we use them in common language as well. Uh, a paradox, something that seems to be, but it isn't the case. Or something you want to be true, but doesn't seem to be, but is true. Luther loved paradox. And here is a quote by Luther, which gives us the paradox of what being a Christian is. It is a paradoxical thing to be a Christian because a Christian is a servant to every person that he or she meets. Everyone. There is no waving away an image bearer that God has placed in front of you. This is the teaching of Jesus on what love is, on who my neighbor is, and here Luther zooms in on another paradox. A Christian man or woman is the most free Lord of all, subject to none. 
A Christian man is the most dutiful servant of all and subject to everyone. And Luther, this phrase, you can just start to Google it and it pops up. This is a common quote of Martin Luther. And it demonstrates clearly the paradoxical nature of what it means to be a Christian. You are most free and Lord of all, subject to absolutely nobody but God the Father, which then makes you the most dutiful servant of all and subject to every one. It could be a contradiction, but when you understand your freedom and being Lord correctly, then it's not in the same sense also calling us the most dutiful servant of all and subject to everyone. Something happens here that changes, that allows both of these things to be true. The same Lord who frees you, the same Lord who calls you a vice-regent, meaning a divine representative of the King Most High. We are kings, we are priests, and we are prophets of God. That same relationship, that same dynamic with God also puts you in the category of a most dutiful servant of all and subject to all. Yes, it is God's relationship with you that makes all the difference in the world. Now, why do I go down this road? Tertullian, who lived in the second century of the church, and who was the man who coined the word Trinity to the Christian faith. Trinity is not found in the Bible. It is something that the church wrestled with through time. And indeed, Tertullian's doctrine would be challenged and overtaken by what was called Arianism. And Arianism believed that Jesus Christ was a preeminent divine being, but created and did not have co-equal status as God himself. And that won the day. And Athanasius, the great bishop of the church, ran for his life for years. And the church was fractionalized. And the church was killing each other. Not to be the last time either. Over doctrine over this issue of who is Jesus Christ. And sometimes we poo-poo doctrine. Doctrine divides. And yes, it does. It was meant to, because Christianity is a revelation from God to us about what is true. And either Jesus Christ had a beginning like every other created thing, or within the Godhead, there's this mystery which Tertullian called the Trinity. Three co-equal yet separate persons within the Godhead. And we struggle in our language even now to define personhood and, and to define the co-equal status and so on. And the church produced creeds to this effect. The Nicene Creed and the Chalcedon Creed to establish now what's considered Christian orthodoxy. After Athanasius ran for his life, he was able to argue persuasively, and the church regained its orientation and concluded that all of the particulars in this text, the best explanation is that there seems to be three persons within the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and that set the track for the church for the next 2,000 years. And so, yes, doctrine is very, very important. Tertullian is famous for saying something else, two other things. What has Athens to do with Jerusalem? Athens was the place where Plato's Academy was. Plato's Academy was a study center of reason and philosophy. And Tertullian says rhetorically, what has Athens to do with Jerusalem? 
Athens is about learning and reason and logic, and the church is about faith. And indeed, he said in his defense uh, against heretics, he said, we believe because it is absurd. Now, that's a verse somewhat taken out of context, yet Tertullian isn't scripture, and so we probably could say something a little more biblical than we believe because it is absurd. So the church has struggled for 2,000 years on the relationship between reason and the place of thinking and the place of philosophy and the place of theology. Today we live in an era where theology is not esteemed. Theology is not sought after, but rather experience is that which we go to. Now I just spent six minutes talking about the upcoming conference on the Psalms that is more experiential than it is academic. So the church does, is not anti-experiential. But when the church is experiential to the exclusion of the mind, I think we have a problem. And we do have a problem. Even we struggle with doctrine and, and teaching, that somehow it's not practical, that somehow it's not relevant, that somehow it's to be kept within the four walls of a seminary or something to that effect. And all we want from the pulpit are stories and something that warms us. And all of that's good as far as it goes. But it's my observation and the observation of many in the church that we've gone too far. And history usually reflects this kind of stuff. The, the air is way over here, and, and it takes a while for the church to accept the air. And then what happens? Well, the pendulum goes the other direction, but it doesn't stop where it should. It goes too far. And the church was lacking an experiential balance, but I think we've gone too far. Now, our text deals with faith here in Romans and also in uh, Mark. There's paradox here. Let's just take the Mark at, uh, one. Starting with verse 31, it's in your bulletin if you want to look at it. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said this to them plainly. Now see, Jesus had spoken in parables before and a lot. And they asked him, Jesus, why do, why do you speak in parables? And he says, so that the wise and the prudent, uh, you can paraphrase that to mean the arrogant and the unbelieving, so that they don't see, so that they don't understand. So Jesus purposefully took steps to hide his message, to hide the content of his person and his work. But here it says, interestingly, he spoke plainly to them. Why would the Spirit want us to know that Jesus is speaking plainly here? Because it's, it's very clear what he's saying. Uh, the Son of Man, me, uh, his most cherished phrase of all, of all, his self-description of being the Son of Man. He must suffer many things, in verse 31, and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. That's, that's pretty plain. He's not just speaking of persecution. He's not just speaking of death, but he spoke of his resurrection. And here the liberal church says, oh, this can't be. This must be a, what they call a post-event rewriting of an earlier manuscript. Why does the liberal want to say that? Because we know that you can't know the future. Uh, we, we know that uh, this is just too simple and plain here. But you see, those are just prejudices of certain people. This isn't a rewriting. It says that Jesus came and gathered his disciples and he spoke plainly to them. But something's going on with Peter. Peter can't digest this because he thinks, Peter thinks the Messiah has come to save. 
And we smile because we know that salvation comes through the cross. We know that salvation comes through his suffering. We know that salvation comes because he bore our sin and he bore our punishment, but Peter did not know that. Peter wanted Rome's butt kicked. Peter wanted Rome out of the picture. He, Peter, gravitated to all those verses, uh, promises to Abraham that he's going to make the Jews a great nation, that they're going to rule over their enemies. This is what Peter gravitated toward. This is the either-or thinking that Peter applied to the text that spoke about the Jewish Messiah. But there were other texts. Isaiah 53 spoke of the Messiah who would uh, suffer and who's by his stripes we are healed and that it pleased God to bruise him. So, so, so Peter was selective in where he looked. And we're like that. We're like that in marriage. We're like that in our friendships. We're like that when we get attacked. It's called defensiveness. We see things through our perspective. We challenge another person's perspective. Peter is no different here. Peter liked those verses that said they're going to beat up on Rome. Peter loved those verses that said God's promises are sure and faithful and that he's going to establish nations and kings from Abraham, and we're Abraham's children. And so, Jesus, if you're the anointed one, then let's go and kick Rome out of the picture. And we want our land back. We want Jerusalem back. Interestingly, what Jesus does with Peter's rebuke, yes, Man rebuked God here in verse 32. Peter took him aside and rebuked him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Luther called this the theology of glory. Luther explained why we are singularly focused on winning, on having the enemy defeated. Uh, and yet God seems to be bringing victory in through the very thing that shamed Peter. Now, God is not into just coming in through his apparent opposite. Indeed, the cross isn't his apparent opposite. The cross is a declaration of God's unmovable, unchanging holiness. The cross is the way that mercy and truth can finally kiss one another and that man and he, women can finally be saved. So it isn't really about God appearing to be weak that God somehow glories in, end of story. No, on the contrary, God's glory is in the cross. God's glory and nature and His faithfulness are seen in the cross once you see it from His perspective his unchanging nature, his refusal to let e evil go unpunished, his commitment to his people to secure their salvation in a way in which no one can take it away from them. That's the glory of God. That is the cross of Christ. But according to man's wisdom and man's foolishness, uh, that is foolishness. They want a man on a white horse and a sword in his mouth. He's coming. Just let a few chapters of history roll out. That's coming. Now, with Abraham, Abraham believed God. Abraham did not waver in his faith, but rather... He hoped against hope. You see, now this is where hope has a contradictory, a paradoxical sense to it. Faith is called to believe and hope against hope. 
And what is the against hope that Abraham is refusing to submit under and choosing rather to believe in hope? Well, I think it's clear. It's the order that we see and notice the world. Hundred-year-old people do not bear children. It just isn't the way the world works. It says that her body and his body was as good as dead. And so therefore, when the God who claims to be the true and living God promises to raise children up from your loins and indeed make you have nations and kings coming from you, it seems kind of silly. It seems foolish that victory is seen in defeat. It seems foolish that uh, as many uh, more than the stars in the sky are promised to someone whose body can no longer function in the way that bears children. This is what it means to hope against hope because the natural order says, no, it cannot happen. Now, the lesson to be learned there is not that one of us in our 80s or 90s is going to stand up and say, I'm pregnant. Okay, this is not the lesson here. The lesson is that God's redemptive plans are coming through what human wisdom deems impossible and foolish. I think this is what Tertullian meant when he said, we believe because it is absurd. God is hiding against the wise and the prudent or the arrogant and the hubris of humanity. He's frustrating their wisdom. And so God gives us faith. And God gives us hope, but against hope of the natural order, and even in somewhat against reason. Now, now we need to be a little more careful. I'm going to go to Luther here, because Luther <laughs> is a very colorful person, and he liked hyperbole, and he liked paradox. And he said things that are often misconstrued. Luther did attack our reason. He called reason a red murderess. He called reason the devil's bride. He called reason a damned whore. He called reason a blind guide. He called reason the enemy of the faith. You see, so Tertullian who says, we believe precisely because it is absurd. Now give Luther a little time. Give us a little holistic picture of Luther. He said, the greatest and most invincible enemy of God is reason. But when you study Luther, Luther also said this about reason. It's the most important gift to man. Reason is inestimable beauty and excellence. Reason is a glorious light. Reason is a most useful servant, and reason is something divine. You see, people have a hard time with Luther. They either focus on one and leave the other, or they say Luther just loves paradox and there's no real soundness in his theology, neither of which is true. So what did Luther mean? Luther affirmed the principle of what's called the probability is the guide of life. You know, if you drop a heavy book end on your toe once, you know something about gravity. And you know if you don't hold on to it next time, it will probably happen again. This is the beauty of reason. Uh, it, is, it is called also common sense. Now, the implications for theology are clear. Luther recognized, as do those who understand this problem, 
that at best, a rational approach to the knowledge of God can never go beyond a high degree of probability. That's what reason does. That's why the egg can be something your doctor said, don't eat anymore, it has cholesterol in it, and you've got to stay away from that. And now they say the egg's okay, because it has enough HDL to counteract the, H the LDL to counteract the HDL, and so on and so forth. And that's what science does. It just changes when it finds something out, and it reasons on the basis of probability and common sense. Now, the skepticism of reason for Luther is that no reason is so firm that it cannot again be overthrown by reason, just like I gave you about the egg. Knowledge today might not be the knowledge of tomorrow. We might find other things that change what we believe today. There is no counsel, no matter how magnificent or strong, which cannot again be destroyed by human counsel, wisdom, and strength. And this can be seen in all things. Only the word of God remains to all eternity. But to Luther, the commonly accepted rule, probability is the guide of life, would have been an abomination in the area of religious knowledge. Luther says the very essence of unbelief is that men say, I do not know, I am not sure. Now, pause on that a little bit here. Luther says the very essence of unbelief is not that men say, I don't believe in God. Listen to what Luther's saying. The very essence of unbelief is that men say, I do not know. I'm not quite sure. That's called agnosticism. This is the whore of reason, according to Luther, if you try to bring reason into your relationship with God. Why? The natural knowledge of God is by its very nature subject to doubt. The human reason can never come to a sure knowledge of God. This is Luther. But sure knowledge is what we must have if we are to have peace of conscience. This to Luther was always basic to the whole problem. Now, if we were to go back in screens and see Luther's comparison of a murderous devil's bride, a damned whore, and a blind guide, and the enemy of all faith. That's what Luther's talking about. Your faith is not based on probability. You go drive to Cheyenne, and you, in some sort of natural faith, you believe that the person coming the other direction is going to stay in that lane. Otherwise, you would never drive to Cheyenne. But that's not faith. That's probability. That's just common sense. That's living in the real world. But faith isn't of the real world. Faith is a gift from God to you to believe. Solidly, unmovingly, unflinchingly, securely, with great assurance. That's why reason is the devil's bride. That's why reason is a damned whore from Luther's perspective. Because it only yields more doubt and uncertainty because that's all she can give you. But not so faith. Faith can lead you to hope against hope. Faith can lead you to be strong in faith even though the signs seem to point in the other direction. And it gives you an assurance because faith isn't a probability game. Faith is a gift from God. That's why Christians should die peacefully. Now that doesn't mean there isn't a struggle during the passage of our death because we don't have the full capacity of faith. There will be no doubts in heaven. There will be no uncertainties in heaven. There will be no fears in heaven. Not of those kind. But in this life, there's a mixture. And faith is called to fight against those uncertainties. And there's a battle there's a wage, and we must take up the battle, and we must take up the armor of God to wage against this apparent humility of, well, 
there may be a God. Well, I'm glad that your faith makes you happy. No. The tomb is empty. God has bound our sin on that man. And my eternal life ultimately depends on whether or not Jesus Christ has risen from the dead and that God is true to what he says. And faith won't let go of what reason can only play with in terms of probability. That's why there is an antithesis or a struggle or a tension between reason and faith. Because faith isn't an exercise in probability. Faith isn't a common sense thing in that sense. But it is the gift of God that allows you to hope against hope In verse 16 in Romans, it says that we depend on faith. In order that, verse 16, the purpose clause, the promise may rest on grace. You see, it's God's gift, it's God's Christmas to us to give us His Son. There's a purpose and a reason why the whole Christian life is lived in and through faith. Because God doesn't want you to play a mere probability game. He wants your conscience at peace. And he wants you to know that that peace has come from his grace. His kindness that is in and through his son Jesus Christ, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Let's stand and confess the Nicene Creed together. Or let's do the Apostles' Creed together. The first one, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. And at this point, we'll have the prayers of God's people, which is your opportunity to bring your prayers to our awareness by praying out loud and have us pray with you as you pray out loud. If you do that, please raise your voice so that we can hear you. You can also share off scripture. You can just do whatever God lays on your heart. When there's sufficient silence, I will lead us in the Lord's Prayer. So let's go to him in prayer.
I especially pray for Kay and Wade that they will continue to have prayers and feel the prayers and have the health care providers be guided. And I pray the same for Joel Ofdahl and his family in this most recent setback. Please just help them stay strong, help them stay close to you, and may you be glorified through all of this. Lord, I lift up Brother Richard Grove, who again has had more complications than other surgeries. Give him strength, give the doctors knowledge, give him skill, that he might gain his strength back again, and be with him to restore him to his health again, if it is your will. I pray for our sister uh, Virginia, who has passed on. Pray for her family and, and guide them in their sorrows. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Lord, uh, your word has said that we are called to pray for those in authority over us. Given that the legislature's in session, I do pray that you <coughs> continue to be present in that process. I pray that you give them down there wisdom to do what is right, especially by you, but also by the people of this state. I pray that you'll make things transparent. I think, pray that you'll expose any trickery down there. Uh, let them discuss things openly and honestly as they seek to uh, provide a budget for us all to live under. I pray that you'll continue to raise up people down there who are on your side and bring others who aren't to your side. I thank you for uh, Sherry Steinmetz's efforts down there to provide a special area so legislators can go in and pray, seek your will, and seek your faith. Um, to be in that process uh, and bless us with peace so that uh, we may continue to worship and exercise our religion freely in this country, turn away those who seek and are not seeking to prevent that. Um, again, I pray for revival, repentance, and reformation in your church first and outward to the world. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Nim come, my will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Temptation, deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let's sing the doxology together. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary, evermore praising you and singing. 
Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest, as it is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. <clears throat> On the night that our Lord was betrayed, he was in the upper room. It was during the Passover. And he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body given for you. He took the cup of blessing, and when he had given thanks, he poured the fruit of the vine. And he said, this is my blood, the new covenant, my blood shed for you for the remission of sins. This drink of it, all of you, in remembrance of me. And with that, he instituted an ongoing celebration within the body of Jesus Christ that allows us to proclaim his death by identifying in this meal as a believer and a follower of him. If you believe and trust in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, this table is for you because he speaks here. Maybe reason doesn't see it. Maybe it is uncertain, but faith is not uncertain. And God's Word speaks its creative, forceful power in and through this table. We will line up on this side, come through, and you will have the opportunity to support the work of this ministry at this time, if you so choose, and then return back to your seats. May I have an elder to assist in the distribution, please? So when you're ready, just come up and uh, hear God's Word, the body of Christ given for you, the body of Christ given for you, the body of Christ given for you, the body of Christ given for you. The body of Christ given for you. Body of Christ given for you. Body of Christ given for you. The body of Christ given for you. Amen. The body of Christ given for you. The body of Christ given for you. Body of Christ given for you. Body of Christ given for you. The 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 body of Christ given for you. 
the body of Christ given for you. The body of Christ given for you. The body of Christ given for you. The body of Christ given for you. The body of Christ given for you. The body of Christ given for you. You, the body of Christ given for you. Let's stand together and sing our closing song, Shout to the Lord, number 136, 137. All of my days I want to praise The wonders of your mighty love My comfort, my shelter Tower of refuge and strength Let every breath, all that I am Never cease to worship you. <clears throat> Shout to the Lord, all the earth, let us sing. Power and majesty, earth to the King. Mountains bow down and the sea will roar at the sound of your name. I sing for joy at the work of your hand. Forever I'll love you, forever I'll stand. Nothing will occur to the promise I have in you. And promises we do have. Faith grasps them. Faith rests and trusts in them. And so I give you a promise from God. I give you the promise that faith will not let go of. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Go in the peace of the Lord.